today we'll discuss a bit about functional reactive programming in JavaScript, more of a FRP inspired system in JavaScript. We'll see how we can use FRP to change the way we write asynchronous code in JavaScript, both on the server side and on the uh, front end side. So before we get into FRP, uh, I would like to share a story of a dear friend of mine. Coyote was a software developer, always chasing JavaScript, uh, like all of us. He never caught it though, uh, neither uh, do most of us. So he was given a task. He had to render uh, some tweets to a web page. A very simple task, right? So uh, now uh, he made a small assumption about his task. He assumed that he has an array of tweets, of 100 or so tweets. And he had to render them to the web page. Now he is an awesome developer. So he divided his uh, specs quite clearly into three requirements. Uh, the requirements are, uh, he has to show the tweets for the single user only, the selected user only, and he has to uh, show the only those tweets which have a particular hashtag. And he has to replace the text emojis in his tweets with images. So he starts with his development, uh, with his solution. So he takes the source, uh, tweets from the source, and he do the first operation, the first task. He uses filter for that. Uh, now, filter is an array extra function. It takes a function, execute that function on every item in the array, and creates a new array with those items for whom this function returns true. So basically filtering the array, creating a new array. Notice we are using uh, arrow syntax here, fat arrow syntax. Uh, it is just creating a function uh, with one argument t and uh, returning the statement. Okay, so first uh, problem is done. Now for the second, uh, he has to show the only those tweets which have a particular hashtag. Quite simple, just another filter. So he does. And uh, for the third problem, uh, he has to manipulate the tweets now. So for that, he uses map. Now map is uh, just same as filter, uh, but uh, in that it takes a function, execute it on uh, every item, and then it creates a new array with the output of produ a product of this function. So he has uh, all his three problems solved. So next, uh, uh, the cherry on the top, he has to render them. For that, he uses for each. So his problem is solved, and uh, quite beautifully so. Now he's proud. He's, he think he has uh, written very good code, <clears throat> and he's right. I think. If we look at his code. His code has no dangling state around outside the operations. Each operation is uh, fully contained. Uh, so the code is stateless. Stateless code, easily maintainable code, and it is composed of smaller operations to do the whole thing, and it is uh, still further uh, composable. And the code is not mutating the source. It's a big thing. If you mutate the source, uh, it becomes very hard to test the operation. So you mutate it every time. How do you test it? So uh, these functional properties, uh, these uh, functional things bring a lot of value to our code. So this his whole operation looks like something like this. He has a source. He has a bunch of operations working on the source, and that manipulates uh, the data, and then takes the data to the sync. So uh, he took the tweets, do a bunch of operations on the tweets, and then rendered them. Uh, put the manipulated data to the sync. Now, uh, these operations are special here in that they do not mutate the code, and they do not depend on anything outside themselves. No dependency on the external state. In other words, these are pure functions. Uh, for just to be safe, the emoji is here might not be a pure function, but let us assume that it is. So uh, these functional properties, these pure functions, bring a lot of value to our code. For once, the code becomes very much readable. So you can just look at it and say that there are four separate operations and uh, just understand it in one go. Uh, assume if it was uh, in a big a loop doing a bunch of things, if this, if that. Next, the code is maintainable. Now, there is no dangling state. The code is highly readable. You will be a lot less afraid to touch this code in future. And it is testable. Uh, pure functions are easiest to test. You just pass it uh, uh, the right input, and you will get the, exactly the same output every time you test it. 
and it is extensible. Uh, it is composed of smaller uh, operations, and you, if you we want to add something more, we just add another operation to it. <clears throat> For instance, he is rendering each tweet one at a time. If we want to do it in a bulk, uh, it is just a matter of adding a reduce operation. And it is reusable, of course. Uh, he has to create a smaller mod uh, operations for the whole thing, uh, which makes it obvious where they can be reused. Uh, but it is JavaScript, and the only dreams that come uh, true in JavaScript are the nightmares. So the reality bumps in eventually, <clears throat> and it is not pretty. So turns out the source that gives him the tweets is not really giving him an array or something. It gives him one tweet at a time, and it is asynchronous. So he makes a request somewhere and gets one tweet at a time. So now all his functional awesomeness, the composability and all goes to the sync with the data. So uh, what options do we have here with the asynchronous uh, data that he has now? So first option is using callbacks. You know, callbacks are pretty, very pretty. So pretty you need eye bleach just to keep your eyes from bleeding. But the problems with callbacks are real. So first thing is the composition is uh, out of window. How would you compose a synchronous stream inside a synchronous stream? Uh, pretty hard to do. And uh, the state, dangling state in callbacks is uh, more than nasty. Just assume you are five levels deep in callbacks, and the number two callback said something, number four callbacks use it. Not debug. Uh, not funny. <laughs> OK, and the code is pretty hard to read. So hard to read, uh, dangling state, uh, not really maintainable. And testability is like, yeah, it's a joke. OK, the second option he has is to use a promise. Uh, now, promises are awesome. They are awesome in that callbacks treated asynchronous values as a bastard child of JavaScript for ages. Now, promises made the asynchronous values first-class citizens. We can pass them around uh, as arguments, keep them in variables, until we need to get the real value. But uh, they, after a line is crossed, promises have same problems as callbacks, almost same problems. First, they are hard to compose, quite hard to compose. Uh, and they resolve act, uh, exactly once. Once a, problem, a promise is resolved or it uh, has given an error, it is pretty much useless after that. And canceling a promise in a pool of, say, 100 uh, asynchronous requests is not something you would do, no, do on a fun, uh, sunny weekend. OK, so maybe it is time to make a compromise. Now, he has to use his uh, asynchronous source. So uh, he has to make a compromise. Either you, he uses callbacks or he uses promises. In either case, all his composability, the readability, all the awesomeness that those uh, pure functions brought is gone, right? But no, uh, he lived a life of no compromise. He won't compromise, not in the face of callbacks. <laughs> so what he does instead, he stood up and jumped out of his window. No choice, right? Uh, uh, Windows reminded him of another awesome technology from his favorite uh, uh, corporation, not Acme. So Microsoft has this uh, awesome thing called RxJS. These are the reactive extensions for JavaScript. Now, reactive extensions have been in C Sharp forever. Uh, but they have brought it over to many languages now, uh, including uh, C++, C Sharp. Uh, it already had them. Uh, Objective-C, Java. <coughs> and uh, maintained by Microsoft. So you can say that it is not something uh, just a toy. And uh, learn once and uh, implement everywhere is the trend, right? React Native. So yeah, you can uh, learn RxJS in one of the languages, and semantics are pretty much same in uh, most of them. So how would the code look like if he had used RxJS instead, uh, all the asynchronous code? Now he has a, a source which returns one tweet asynchronously. So something like this. We converted uh, the source which gave a promise to an observable. Now observable is the central piece of uh, RxJS. And then he. I just, I think I copied the synchronous code. Did I make a mistake? Is it the same code copied? So it was a mistake, right? What if it is not? What if you can write the synchronous code just like this? Now, this is a synchronous version. And this is the supposedly right, maybe wrong, asynchronous version. Almost exactly the same thing, right? 
So uh, maybe uh, the observable is the unicorn which allow you to uh, write the code in this flowing fashion using pure functions and all, keeping all the awesomeness of pure uh, functional code. Maybe. Okay, let's look at this uh, unicorn. Okay, so an observable is a data set, a set which updates over time. So like promises is a, promise is a value which gets its uh, actual data after in, from future. Similarly, observable does the same thing, do the same thing. Now, uh, these are the building blocks of uh, functional reactive programming inspired systems in RxJS. FRP is not really possible in JavaScript. It is not concurrent, but it is a FRP inspired system and quite beautiful, we'll see. And they are like promises. Uh, they make asynchronous values first class citizens. So you can pass these observables around in functions, uh, compose them together. And uh, they have a very good functional grammar, like array extras, we have map, filter, uh, and all that. Observable provides similar operators and a lot more than array extras, <coughs> uh, which uh, allow you to compose them very well. And they play really well with other sorts of data that we have. So, but <coughs> why should you care, right? Now, observables are awesome, of course you should use them, but why bother? We don't like new things. So, uh, why you should care? The first thing is that uh, there is a proposal to make observables uh, native in ES7. Like, promises are native in ES6 now. So, hopefully, observables will be in ES7. And Angular 2 supports them. Uh, it is, uh, they are integrated into Angular 2. So, if you really want to master that thing, I hope most of you do. So you need to know this. <coughs> and the new hotkit in the town, uh, it has plans to support them first class. Now, uh, so now I have you uh, convinced. So what is an observable? So uh, if we uh, take a look at our code from a junior dev's perspective, it is mostly about uh, flow of data. Like we have some data, we do some manipulations on it, and then we uh, do some side effects to it, to show it to, you, to the user or keep it in the database or something like that. So how do we represent this data in our day-to-day uh, -day imperative programming? as variables, uh, values in variables. So now in our usual programming, we don't consider time to be a factor. We don't think that time is something. It makes perfect sense though. We, have, uh, we deal with asynchronous data often, and we don't have that data always. We get it from future. So if we consider uh, time in our programming, <coughs> let us call it temporal programming, okay? The programming which considers time. So how do we represent a, a value in temporal programming? Something which don't have its data yet, but will have in future. A promise, right? So, but we don't deal with values directly. We keep them uh, in collections. We deal with the plural of values. Uh, and that is uh, iterable in JavaScript. Uh, in ES5, these are arrays. ES6 has more forms of them. So what would be the plural? of a promise. How do we represent a collection of observables, uh, a collection of asynchronous values? An array of uh, promises is the wrong answer. <clears throat> it is just not the same thing. Now, this is the spot that this observable fills. Observable is a, uh, uh, you can think of it as an array which is spanned over time, a uh, collection which gets its values in future, one by one. <clears throat> So uh, then these observables have these operators that allow you to uh, do uh, almost the same stuff as we do with arrays. Like this is the code which, uh, a synchronous code using an array, and this is a uh, asynchronous alternative, okay? It allows, uh, if you know the array extras, how to use array extras, you already know how to use observables. Okay, now, uh, in my opinion, uh, observable is natural evolution of promise. So if promise is uh, Bulbasaur, what is an observable? Evolve Bulbasaur, of course. Now, about the API, <clears throat> the promises have these resolve and reject and then an error for while creating and uh, using the promise. Observable has uh, on next and on error, doing the same thing in both the cases. Now, it is called on next because it is a collection and it will get its values uh, maybe more than once. Uh, but it is a collection, so it might finish sometime, right? It might have a length. Uh, we, we don't know it yet, but it will at some point. Uh, and when it completes, uh, we have this uncompleted callback. So all these three things together, they are called an observer. So uh, observer is uh, 
say as important as observable. I didn't mention it earlier because we don't usually create observers directly. We have a subscribe method on an observable to which we pass either one of these three, two or all of these three functions, callbacks, and <clears throat> RxJS creates an observer implicitly. So why am I I'm mentioning it now if it is not, uh, or we don't really directly use it? No, observables are lazy in that, uh, say, uh, now this code, uh, take an observable and uh, do something with, uh, with it. <clears throat> now this code will not execute. It will just stay there. It will not execute until we uh, connect an observer to it with the subscribe method. Only at this point, this code will start executing. Uh, and uh, this is a very nice feature. It makes reusing the observables uh, very easy, uh, intuitive, I would say. And there are many operators on observables, like map, filter, reduce, scan, uh, many, lot many. For any case you might uh, think of. And there are a lot many than, more than this. And we can convert almost anything to an observable, be it variables and arrays, promises, events, callbacks, or even generators. And generators and promises have first class put in observables. You don't need to convert them every time. Okay? And observables are disposable. <clears throat> now, uh, we convert events to observables, right? And what's the uh, most common source of memory leaks in JavaScript? Event listeners. We add them, we forget to remove them. Now, when we create a subscribe, uh, it creates a dis uh, disposable. When you subscribe to a, uh, an observable, and you, we can dispose it with disposable.dispose, and it will uh, free all the resources or remove the event listeners and everything. But it is declaratively, we can you do this declaratively. Uh, we don't really need to call disposable.dispose if we use it properly. Now notice, uh, here I created clicks observable. <clears throat> this observable will have a value every time I click on this count button. Okay? But I said that take only five. Okay, uh, forget about this zip thing. I said that only take five clicks from um, my dis uh, observable. <clears throat> and after that, it knows that I only need five uh, clicks. And after that, there is no use of it. It will dispose it by itself. So one, two. After this, the event listener is removed. So the chances of memory leaks, if we do it the proper way, are very less. We don't ne really need to remember to remove all those. And about performance, so observables, RxJS team try its best to uh, keep the observables have as little footprint as uh, possible. Uh, so because we create an observable every time we do that map thing, no? So it has to be like. And swappable concurrency, now JavaScript is not really concurrent, right? So, but uh, this uh, uh, observables has this thing called schedulers. Schedulers allow you to put your callbacks where you want, like how you want to execute them on the uh, set immediate uh, or uh, process dot next click or uh, next tick <laughs> uh, or uh, the way we want. <clears throat> for example, for animations, we want them to be executed on request uh, animation frame, right? So we can swap them. And uh, say uh, when we use arrays, the, uh, the map, the filter, it creates an intermediate array every time, <clears throat> right? More work for garbage collector. Uh, since uh, observable is not really a complete collection at any point, uh, the, it don't create all this uh, intermediate memory. And it supports it transducers, so you can even avoid creating observables. And it, uh, for to be any library to be used, it has to play well with uh, other stuff, right? <clears throat> so we can create observables from native events. We can do the same with jQuery or Zepto events from jQuery promises. Just make a jQuery.get request and convert it to, uh, it to an observable or just use it directly inside uh, an observable chain. But we use frameworks, right? <clears throat> so uh, there are bindings available for most frameworks. So you can just uh, add another library and start using observables uh, within your present uh, apps uh, that you're using frameworks. And <clears throat> the company which has created RxJS has created this beast as well, the IE6, right? So I know most of you have nightmares of it still. So the support uh, for uh, RxJS goes as back as IE6. Uh, they have these compatible builds which support even IE6. So uh, time for some examples. <coughs> First example we'll see is uh, called follow the mouse. We'll create a three part mouse chain in which the first part follows the mouse immediately, the second part follows the mouse a little delayed, okay? 
the third part, it uh, follows the mouse even more delayed and it wriggles. So demo. So uh, here it is. Okay, the uh, first part, it follows the mouse right away. The second part, it comes a little late and the third part comes even late. And it wriggles because it is too happy. Now imagine how we do it in uh, how we do it in imperative programming. <coughs> Any proposals? How we'll uh, coordinate this uh, delay? That uh, the first part is easy. We just add a, an event listener. Then we have the second part, which does the same thing but little delayed. And the third part does two things. Sorry. Yeah, <coughs> set timeout. How will they play together? Like there are th three things. They have to happen in coordination. So let us have a look at how the first part is done. Okay, first thing we do is we convert the event to an observable. I uh, use this uh, um, uh, underscore at the end just to be sure that it is an observable. Uh, my thing, personal thing. And then uh, we have to move the position of that uh, block, right? For that, we need the coordinates, the x and the y. For that, we create another two observables, the left and the top from the, obs uh, uh, the observable we created from the event listener. And then here are, here's our, uh, that uh, element. And then we simply do uh, set left. Set left is a simple function. Uh, which just change the uh, left and right uh, and left and top on the style. So uh, the code is just as simple for the first uh, uh, the first block. Now second block does the sa uh, pretty much the same thing but little delayed, right? And uh, set timeout uh, will not really play that well. For that, uh, in this example, we simply just add just one line of code. We call it that. Say that. Uh, now my observable is getting these values whenever I move my mouse. Uh, my observable is getting these values whenever I move, move my mouse. But for the second, uh, my second block, I want these values late. Okay, send these to me, but send them after uh, this delay milliseconds. So. Uh, Uh, these, uh, say, this is our observable that actually comes when we move the mouse. Say it has these one to three values. Uh, what delay does is just delays them. Say send these to me a little late. And for the third one, we have the same thing delayed and we create another source uh, which uh, give us a value between minus five to plus five uh, every 100 milliseconds. Okay, uh, we use interval for that. So uh, it, it was just a matter of adding uh, four more lines to uh, make the third block be coming late and uh, work well with the another interval that we set. Okay, uh, enough fun. Uh, little bit of a uh, more real world example. Uh, this autocomplete is like the hello world of FRP. Any FRP uh, library that you will see anywhere presented, it will always have this. So, okay, uh, this is what we wanna do. Uh, here is an input block. Whenever user uh, adds something and ent enters something, we send a request to Wikipedia and show the suggestions. Quite simple, right? <coughs> but uh, we have some conditions here that uh, we will not send a request until user has entered more than three characters, or more than two characters, okay? We send a request only after the third character. And we don't send a request if user keeps typing something. We don't want to bombard the server. We want to send a request only when user stops typing and there is no activity for some time. And we don't send a new request if the, uh, the value is not changing. Now oh, maybe internet. So if user uses cursor keys, we don't send a request. Okay, it is not uh, really as easy as it might look like. So uh, let us uh, see how we'll do it. First thing we'll do it is create an uh, observable from the event, right? We want uh, some, to do something when user presses a key. So that's what we do. We create a, an observable from the key up, and we take the value of the, uh, uh, the input element every time he presses a key. So next thing we wanna do is that we don't want to, it to proceed if the value is less than two. 
uh, if the value's length is less than two. So for that, a simple filter. And next, <coughs> we don't want to do something uh, until we have uh, 200 milliseconds of inactivity. Simple a matter of adding a debounce. Then we don't go ahead until uh, the user's value change. If user value is not changing, we just keep it up to here. And eventually, we make a request to the uh, server. It, the, now this function does uh, just one thing. Uh, it just creates a jQuery request and sends it as a promise. That's it. We don't even convert it to a observable. So what this flat map does is that now we have a user is entering continuously after 200 millisecond delay. Now we are sending a request to the server, like first goes, second goes, third goes. Now uh, we don't want to handle each and every one of those, right? We just want the latest one. This is what this flat map latest does. It will get, take or receive all the requests, keep receiving them, but uh, will give us only the latest one. <coughs> so a quite complicated, uh, not really complicated. It is actually quite complicated when we do it in the real world using parity programming. So does, it is done in these, this many lines of code. So uh, I started using these observables, uh, RxJS, a few months back. So since I started using them, I found some very happy side effects in my code. Like the things I didn't want, really want to do, but happen. First thing was, when I start up, uh, solving a problem, I usually make a monolith, just uh, something which do a simpler version of what I do. And the second phase is to make it modular to keep adding more features. Now, I found that uh, my code was always almost uh, already modular. I just, it was just a matter of taking observables and putting them in right place for APIs. Because we are creating, uh, say, streams of uh, flow. Right? This is uh, how one operation is done. And uh, modularizing them is uh, mostly matter of either just put the observable in the right place or split it uh, in the half and sort of that. And the code was reusable, like we used those left and uh, top observables back there. <coughs> and it is uh, very easy to read code. Uh, so uh, I use this mostly on my hobby projects uh, at the moment. So I visit them sometimes weeks later or months later. <coughs> So uh, the code is very easy to read. Just look at them, and I know what uh, it is doing. Uh, and all this I get by default. I didn't really have to put any effort to do this. <coughs> and in conclusion, uh, the, uh, we use, uh, doing the asynchronous programming, we got the same benefits as doing synchronous programming using arrays. Like the, uh, Our code is composable. Like, uh, we write the code in a flowing fashion. <clears throat> there are uh, small, smaller operations doing, working in coordination with each other. And uh, it is readable, uh, so it's maintainable. And RxJS actually has a great error handling. So if uh, any times an error happens at any of those points, uh, the, R, uh, the error callbacks is executed, and the observable stops. It is actually the killer feature of uh, FRP, uh, RxJS, which made me choose it over CSP for playing. Uh, but uh, it's more of a homework. So uh, using RxJS, we got elegant declarative code, asynchronous code. It is asynchronous, so it came late. <coughs> so yeah, I hope to see some of you on the dark side. Thank you. Questions?